patria, tengo fe en Chile y su destino. Digan ustedes, sabiendo que mucho más temprano que tarde, de nuevo, habitan la calle de Salameda, por donde pasa el hombre libre. Para ¡Viva Chile! ¡Viva el pueblo! ¡Viva los trabajadores! This song was on the lips of the soldiers as they marched on the presidential palace. It happens to be a Nazi marching song. Traditionally, the armed forces have been popular in Chile. Generals and admirals have been national heroes. And traditionally, they've stayed out of politics. But when General Pinochet led his army against Allende, he believed he acted with the support of the majority of the Chilean people. His men still solemnly swear to loyally serve their country according to the established laws. was the largest, 37, was the largest group that was let out to be shot inside the stadium, in the playing field itself. At dawn, crowds still occasionally gather to view a corpse cast up by the river. Inevitably, people conclude this is part of the purge of Marxists, but Admiral Marino says no. We don't like killing anybody. Uh, our armed forces are for defense against them. Enemy from abroad, not inside. On the other hand, there's not many um, examples of countries getting rid of communism. So we are kind of a kind of a new experience because if Spain got rid of communism, it was through a long war. For us, it only took us six hours, which is a different matter. So the uh, Spain, uh, we took the, 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 the example of Spain. Well, most of the commons were killed during the war, so they didn't have it. But we do have it. So we have to convince them. And that's our uh, multiple mission, socially. And we're doing it. We're using all the means we have, church and everything, to help us in getting these people into what they should be. Yes, children with some nationalism, and that they want to make the country happy. Till three months ago, these men ruled Chile. 35 members of President Allende's government and party organization have been interned here since the coup. Among them are 13 former cabinet ministers, four members of Congress, and an ex-ambassador to Washington. None of them has so far been brought to trial. A naval officer remarked seriously that the bracing climate and the isolation of Dawson Island could work a spiritual cure on the prisoners. On the understanding that I did not discuss politics, I was permitted to speak briefly to two of the prisoners about their conditions and treatment. The treatment from, from the people of the, of the uh, camp, yes. I would say, is, 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 is good. We don't have any kind of, 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 of things against that. Of course, we work. And what sort of jobs are you doing? Well, we dig uh, holes and we put uh, poles for, for electric transmission. Yeah. We make some repairs in the roads. We, we go uh, cutting timber and that kind of work related to the improvement of, of the island. Uh, How do you spend your day? Well, we start at 7. Later on we have uh, coffee and bread. Uh, at 8 we start working. We work till uh, 
noon. Uh, later on we have luncheon and we start working again at about two and we work from two till five. And then we have uh, a cup of tea and bread. And later on from six to eight we have organized uh, some um, conference uh, among ourselves in the different specialists. Specialists. What we have several specialists. We have several doctors, several lawyers, several engineers here. Economists. Economists and yes. so on. What do you do? What do you do? Well, I am teaching my very poor English to, to, to other people <laughs> of, of our group. So what are your hopes for the next period of time? To, be, to, to, to have lawyers and to go to trial to, and to, to, to clarify our, our legal situation. Es que esos procesos inician porque tenemos conciencia de no haber cometido ningún delito en relación con las leyes del país. What we really want is to have those 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 trials started in order because we are absolutely convinced that we have not have not uh, done anything against the law of, of our country. Even though he seemed very calm when he gave the interview to the BBC Panorama team, Orlando Letalia had already been tortured. He was held in various concentration camps from his arrest, being the first high-ranking official of the Allende government to be arrested on the 11th of September 1973. He would serve time at Tacna Regiment, at a military academy, and later at Dawson Island, where he would be officially a political prisoner held with some of the high-level officials of the Allende government. International diplomatic pressure ensued, and eventually, in September 1974, Orlando Letelier was released on the strict condition that he immediately leave Chile. At first, Letelier and his family resettled in Caracas, but was soon convinced by Saul Landau to move to the United States. In 1975, he made it to Washington, D.C., a place where he eventually would be killed the following year. The ambassador's residence is right off Sheridan Circle, maybe a few, just a few houses down, which is where Orlando Latelier used to uh, hang out when he was ambassador during the early years of the Allende presidency. I had a film that we had shot in Chile called Que Hacer, or What is to be Done. wanted to work, of course, to bring democracy back to Chile and on human rights in general. And both Mark Raskin and Dick Barnett, who were the co-directors of IPS, thought it was a good idea. And we hired him. He didn't stay all that long because Pinochet blamed him for several of the bad things that were happening to Chile as a result of Pinochet's human rights violations. The Kennedy Amendment, which cut off all arms sales and shipments to Chile and then the Harkin Amendment, which cut off all the rest except for humanitarian aid. And although Orlando was not responsible for either one of these, Pinochet in his narrow-shaped brain, of course, blamed him. He ordered the head of the secret police, Manuel Contreras, who was a colonel, to do the job. Contreras, in turn, picked Michael Townley to organize the mission. It was, I remember, a warm, slightly drizzly morning. Orlando's car came to rest just here at the embassy doorstep. Townley had put the bomb at a place in the I-beam where the bomb would blow straight up. Ronnie was sitting in the seat next to him and just took a piece of metal in the throat and that wiped her out. I have just felt an overwhelming sense of sorrow and sadness, but I also felt that we have got to get the people who did this. And there was no question in my mind that the only possible suspect was named Augusto Pinochet. But Pinochet never got his name on that indictment with the signature of the U.S. attorney. And that was a tragic blow to American justice. In 1975, Colonel Manuel Contreras, chief of the Chilean secret police, organized the first inter-American meeting on national intelligence. This was a covert meeting where security delegates from Chile, Bolivia, Argentina, Uruguay, and Paraguay signed up for a new intelligence sharing arrangement designed to track subversives and persons of interest. Brazil joined in 1976, followed by Ecuador and Peru two years later. In addition to sharing information, the accords also allowed for agents of one country to operate easily in another. This meant that people could be tracked and captured easily even after fleeing their country. 
and could be subjected to torture and violence without any sense of protection or asylum. While Operation Condor was not a U.S. program, declassified documents show it undeniably had the backing of the U.S. The U.S. was equally paranoid about Latin America becoming a base for left-wing uprisings, and the brutality of Operation Condor was a convenient and effective method of containment. The Condor program existed during both the Nixon-Ford and Carter administrations. The Nixon-Ford administration directly financed and armed many of the dictatorships involved. The U.S. also directly trained many officials who went on to create the Condor system at the U.S. Army School of the Americas training camp in Panama, where they were taught counterinsurgency tactics. The U.S. also provided communication support which was crucial to the operation of the Condor program. There is no question that the U.S. had full knowledge of the scope and brutality of what was taking place. Operation Condor began to collapse in the late 70s after the assassination of Orlando Letelier, a Chilean diplomat close to Salvador Allende. U.S. President Jimmy Carter pressured the Chilean regime to curb its repressive tactics, while Chile and Argentina began fighting over control of the Beagle Channel in 1977. The conflict, which nearly led to war, also began to create fractures between other dictatorships. But the end of the Condor program did not spell an end to political repression and violence in the region. The different regime's agents and police continued to cooperate to kidnap, murder, and torture people for years to come. The Condor program resulted in an estimated 50,000 killed, 30,000 disappeared, and up to 400,000 arrested and imprisoned. Newly declassified documents obtained by the National Security Archive show that on September 21st, 1976, only five days before a car bomb planted by agents of Chile's Augusto Pinochet regime rocked downtown Washington, D.C., Secretary of State Henry Kissinger rescinded instructions sent to U.S. ambassadors in South America to warn military leaders there against orchestrating a series of international murders. The declassified material has revived questions about Kissinger's role in the secret program of international assassinations by right-wing South American dictators against leftist opponents known as Operation Condor, a program in which the United States is said to have played a supervisory and intelligence-sharing role. A cable sent by Kissinger's office from Zambia, where he was traveling at the time, to his assistant secretary of state for inter-American affairs, Harry Schlaudemann, reads that Kissinger, quote, has instructed that no further action be taken on this matter. The matter in question concerned instructions sent under Kissinger's name to U.S. ambassadors to Chile, Argentina, and Uruguay to make a formal warning to the leaders of their host governments regarding Washington's deep concern about reports it had received of, quote, plans for the assassination of subversives, politicians, and prominent figures, both within the national borders of certain southern cone countries and abroad. The cable ordered the ambassadors to warn to the highest possible officials that such plans would, quote, create a most serious moral and political problem. Only a few days after Kissinger blocked the warning, a massive Operation Condor car bomb murdered former Chilean Foreign Minister Orlando Letelier and his 26-year-old American colleague Ronnie Moffat in Washington, D.C. The National Security Archive's Peter Kornblas said, quote, the Kissinger cancellation and warning the Condor nations prevented the delivery of a diplomatic protest that conceivably could have deterred an act of terrorism in Washington, D.C. By 1976 and the murder of Orlando Letelier on Embassy Row, J. Stanley Pottinger had already been central to some of the most infamous cover-ups in modern history. Watergate, the assassination of Martin Luther King, the standoff at Wounded Knee, and the Kent State Massacre each had Stanley Pottinger's fingerprints all over their official narratives. Pottinger had become the Winston Wolf of the Nixon and Ford administrations, and this Mr. Fix-It wasn't conspiring alone. Pottinger had extremely close ties to George H.W. Bush, who was at this time the director of the CIA. When Eugene Proper began his investigation into the murder of Letelier and Moffat, he was soon linked up with the Justice Department's man for all seasons, J. Stanley Pottinger. Pottinger took Proper to CIA headquarters to discuss Operation Condor with Bush, as covered in Assassination on Embassy Row. On October the 4th, J. Stanley Pottinger, Assistant Attorney General for Civil Rights in Eugene Proper, met with CIA Director George Bush and CIA General Counsel Anthony Lapham to hammer out a solution to the problem of CIA cooperation. Bush said the agency was willing to help if Pottinger and Proper could solve his problem about the executive order banning domestic intelligence gathering. In the course of their discussion of developments in the case, the subject to share his discovery of Operation Condor came up. Bush said that if Attorney General Levy would write him a letter requesting that the CIA initiate an investigation of Operation Condor, they would have a solution to the quandary about CIA cooperation. 
the existence of an international hit squad with the capability of operating on United States turf, he said, was definitely a serious matter of national security within the realms of the CIA's mandate. He foresaw no legal problem in turning over to the FBI the byproducts of such a CIA effort. Over the next few days, Pottinger arranged for the presidential order, and he and Proper ironed out the details of a justice-CIA agreement for secret circumscribed cooperation. The CIA would provide relevant information from CIA files, but justice could not use the information in court unless it had independently obtained it from a separate source. In case the outcome of an investigation turned on a particular piece of CIA information or a CIA witness, the decision to use the information would be made by the president. Proper felt more than satisfied. He was impressed. He had become a member of a very special club. Can I tell you a little story? Please. When I, when I came here, one journalist said, anybody dumb enough to accept the job is too dumb to do it. He got a great laugh from people, because it's a kind of a funny line, let's face it. But God, I said to myself, how sad for our country when we're facing some tough, tough opposition in this world uh, to, 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 to take such a, a cynical view of intelligence uh, in, in, in the 1976 time. I, I, you know, he got his laugh and I got my little hurt inside from it, but it made me determined that, that I'm gonna approach this job with pride and they can have all the jokes they want on television about the CIA. It's vital to the national security of the United States. And I feel so dedicated and strongly about it that I just wanted to wedge that in, apropos of no question you've asked. How long are you going to stay? I serve at the pleasure of the president. I understand that. How long are you going to stay? I'm going to stay as long as the president wants me to stay, Mike. There's no politics in this thing. For me, good heavens. You'd have to be hallucinating to think there was any political mileage in this kind of a job. Four years ago this month, a Democrat they called Jimmy Who went into his party's precinct caucuses in Iowa and, well, you know the rest of that story. In eight days, a Republican they called George Who will go into his party's Iowa caucuses hoping to repeat Jimmy Carter's success story. This Republican's biggest problem, besides a lack of recognition, is that some people say he's just too nice to be president. But although it would take a minor miracle for anyone to take the nomination away from Ronald Reagan at this point, it's been said that if anyone can do it, he can. Who is he? He is George Bush. 55 years old, Phi Beta Kappa from Yale, Navy combat pilot in World War II, a Connecticut Yankee who moved to Texas and made a fortune in the oil business. Former congressman from Houston, former ambassador to the United Nations, chairman of the Republican Party during Watergate, former envoy to China, former director of the Central Intelligence Agency. J. Stanley Pottinger had been working behind the scenes for the Republican Party from at least 1967. This is how he met his good friend George H. W. Bush. In 1977, Pottinger left government service. It's here where his ties to the CIA grew. After all, within a few years, he'll be running guns with Jeffrey Epstein.
been a great reset for the post-corona era.